The word rave has had several branches of meaning throughout history, but the origin of the word used to refer to someone rambling or behaving in a crazy manner, and perhaps even showing signs of legitimate madness, comes from the 14th century Middle English and was itself derived from an old northern French word, raver, which meant to be senseless. In case you were wondering, the word raven, as in the bird, is not necessarily an etymological family member of rave. There were other words traveling around the northern European regions at this time that had similar form, such as the ancestors of the word ravenous and rove, which were hovering around Scotland and Norway, respectively, and which were apparently more likely to be the source of the name given to the black-feathered bird species in question. Modern raves, as in an event that you might attend which is called a rave, are dance parties that grew out of the 1980s acid house dance scene, which itself was the consequence of a new bass synthesizer that had just hit the market, which was called the Roland TB303. And this piece of electronic gear was originally made so that guitarists could have a bass accompaniment even when they played solo, but the device didn't become popular until it was appropriated by the DJ scene to produce ultra-deep bass and distinctive squelching electronic sounds when they played dance music at clubs in Chicago. The music that resulted from this somewhat distinctive electronic process became known as Acid House, and was then picked up and made even more popular by DJs in London, and then made its way to mainland Europe, from whence it was slowly spread throughout the rest of the world. Acid house music eventually led to just house music, which then influenced the makers of trance, jungle, big beat, techno, trip-hop, breakbeat hardcore, and electronic styles of music. And that last style, electronic, and especially a sub-genre of it called electronic dance music, or EDM, grew in popularity in part because it became something associated with a complete experience rather than just a style of music. There was the EDM music, the audio experience, yes, but there were also laser light shows, projected images and film clips, fog machines, pyrotechnics, and all kinds of other visual effects that were produced and programmed to work in tandem with and alongside the music. Another integral aspect of these raves, as they came to be called, was the inclusion of drugs in the experience, especially MDMA or ecstasy, which purported to heighten the experience of the dancers and how they perceived the laser light shows and the music and the dancing and the contact with other people, all of which was a big part of how raves came to be seen as cool and a kind of interesting underground thing to attend, because they often took place in abandoned warehouses or other hidden locations, because no one wanted the cops to show up and catch so many people tripping their asses off. As a consequence of this, the rave scene has been portrayed as both ultra-hip and also as ultra-skeevy in a way, depending on what TV show you're watching or which politician or political talking head you happen to be listening to. A lot of law enforcement resources in many countries have been directed at raves and the rave scene and ravers and rave-like parties and other events in that scene because the understanding is that these events are hotbeds for illegal activities and that very much includes drug dealing and drug usage. And that's what I want to talk about today. Not so much raves or even party culture, but drug use 
and why the way we discuss these drugs and the cultures in which they are most prominent influences how we treat them, societally and legally, but also how those perceptions can blind us to the double standards that we impose when it comes to the use of such substances. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. This episode and every episode of Let's Know Things is brought to you by its wonderful listeners. If you go to letsnotethings.com, you will find an array of different options of how you can contribute to the show. The letsnotethings.com website has recently been updated too, so if you find a typo or something, be sure to let me know. But it's also a great place to check out the show notes for each episode and to find that list of contribution options, which ranges from, you know, direct monetary contribution to checking out the sponsors and even just sharing the show or leaving a review on iTunes. All of these methods of contribution are greatly appreciated. Thank you very much for that. This episode is also brought to you by Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT, you will be helping out the show if you sign up for a free trial of Audible, but you also get that free trial and a free audiobook of your choice from their massive collection. That's audibletrial.com slash LKT. If you can't think of a way to spend that free credit, by the way, off the top of your head, stay tuned till the end of the episode and I will give a book recommendation, something that you might want to spend it on. And this episode is also brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is my hosting company of choice for the aforementioned letsnotethings.com and for all of my online projects. If you go to hostgator.com slash LKT, you will receive a substantial discount from their already very reasonable prices that they provide for listeners of Let's Know Things. That's hostgator.com slash LKT. All right, let's get back to the show. Ecstasy, the recreational drug, is named after ecstasy, the transcendent state. To feel ecstatic is to feel as if you are outside of normal consciousness in some way, and the makers of the drug ecstasy seem to feel that their product achieved something along those lines. But the drug's actual name is MDMA, which is a contraction for methylene dioxymethamphetamine. And this week's article that I want to unspool addresses why what we call this drug matters particularly when we're talking about how we might use it to treat things like post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, the article in question is from theconversation.com, and the title of this article is The MDMA Being Used to Treat Trauma is Different from the Street Drug Ecstasy. And there's a lot of great information in this article. If you go and read it, it is linked to in the show notes, or you can just search for it on theconversation.com. But the point that they're trying to make here is that, essentially, the street drug has become something else, but it still bears the same label that then connects it back to MDMA. And MDMA is a drug that was first concocted in 1912, and by 1970 it was being used for therapeutic purposes by psychiatrists. Because it triggers the release of serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine, in addition to having stimulant and psychedelic properties, it often amplifies the feelings of empathy in patients, while also allowing them to explore their feelings from, quote, outside themselves, end quote. This by itself, that out-of-body experience, proved to be a valuable perspective for these patients to achieve, but paired with the euphoria and the heightened sensations that also tend to emerge as a result of taking MDMA, the positives seemed to dramatically outweigh the negatives of taking this drug. And some of those negatives include insomnia and teeth grinding and a difficulty regulating body temperature and that bane of any drug that alters one perception, or that is interesting and fun in any way, addiction. And these same traits meant that the drug found its way into the party scene shortly thereafter. 
and by the 1980s, MDMA had become associated with raves and the underground dance party scene as a whole. It's around that time, though, that the popularity of the drug, MDMA, also led to a change in what it contained. Now, back in the day, MDMA, or ecstasy as it became known on the open recreational market, was just that. It was pure MDMA. When you popped an ecstasy pill, you knew what you were getting. But from the mid-80s onward, you became increasingly likely to receive a pill that was packed with fillers instead of MDMA. You were more likely to be getting ephedrine or meth or cocaine or ketamine, or especially common today, synthetic cathinones, which are more popularly known in the media as bath salts. In many cases, these adulterants weren't even additives. They completely replaced the MDMA. And so, as addressed in this article, when we talk about, quote, medical trials for using ecstasy with patients, end quote, it creates a false impression of what we're doing. The impression we have of what people who are on ecstasy are like and what happens to them as a result of taking it and the risks that they are taking as a result of taking those pills are not perfect overlays or even relevant expectations for what we can expect of people who take MDMA and particularly not for what we can expect for people who are taking MDMA in a medical setting in regulated doses where the patients are getting plenty of fluids and are unlikely to be dancing around in extremely warm temperatures. But the stigma is still there because of that name and because of its association. People who do not take ecstasy tend to look down on those who do, and even more so than they look down on people who do other types of recreational drugs in a lot of cases. And a big question that I can't help but ask anytime I read something like this is, why? Why do we look down on anyone who does any kind of drug? What is the big deal? We talk about this as if it's understood that drugs are bad, but why do we think that it's our responsibility to legislate how other adults spend their time and what they choose to do to their own bodies? And beyond that, would it be worth our while to allow further drug trials for these substances? despite their negative image with the general public, what possibilities might be close at hand if we could only reach out and start making use of them? One path that we can take to get to those larger questions starts during the Anglo-Chinese War, which took place between 1839 and 1842. The demand for porcelain, silk, tea, and other goods from China in Europe was absolutely immense during the decades leading up to this conflict. And a shooting war was finally ignited by the Chinese emperor's decision to seize from merchants about 2.5 million pounds of opium that had been brought into the country as part of a triangle trade instigated by the British East India Company. The Chinese didn't want much of what they had to offer from Europe, so it was a one-way trade of silver to China in exchange for those Chinese goods that were all the rage in Europe. So to gain more silver that they could use to spend in China on those Chinese goods, the company auctioned off opium that they grew in their Indian plantations to independent traders who, unlike the British East India Company, had access to local Chinese middlemen who could access the interior markets of the country. This, in turn, led to a huge surge in opium, and consequently, opium addiction, in China. Now, the emperor did not like this turn of events, and the drug was already illegal, but it was clear that he needed to take things further to prevent his countrymen from all becoming addicts. So he seized as much opium as he could find without providing compensation for the owners of those trade goods. And the British didn't like how this was done, and that it cut a leg off their triangle trade scheme. So they started firing from their boats at the Chinese, and the following year, they sent in a few dozen steam-powered ships alongside a bunch of more traditional sailing vessels, 
And the guns aboard all these ships, along with their speed and the upgrades in weaponry utilized by their ground troops on their rifles and such, ensured that the British had a massive advantage over the Chinese. And over the next few years, they took city after city and trade route after trade route, and they eventually forced the emperor into a corner and forced him to negotiate and signed the Treaty of Nanking in 1842. The terms of the Treaty of Nanking were very one-sided and are today considered to be one of, and in fact the first of, the so-called unequal treaties with a capital U and a capital T signed by the Chinese and the Japanese during the 19th and early 20th centuries. They were forced to sign these treaties by the newly technologically superior European powers over the course of those decades. And what happened as a result of this, the Chinese had to open up a series of new ports where the British could come in and trade. And it also, by the way, gave the British control of the island of Hong Kong. There were a lot of different ideas about why the British East India Company decided to go to war with China in this manner, and why the British government decided to fund their efforts. The British claimed that they did it to ensure that free and open trade would continue to flourish around the world. Other Western governments, like that of John Quincy Adams' United States, believed that the British were peacocking a bit, trying to make clear that they were still relevant still king of the hill, and would not suffer the grandiosity of those who might disrespect or dishonor them. Many critics of the war held that the British were actually showing their true stripes here, that they would almost sociopathically engage in any kind of trade, even the most morally deplorable kind, if it added more gold to their vaults. The British, it was said by these critics of the war, were so corrupt that they would go to war with another sovereign nation whose only sin was trying to keep their citizenry safe from a poison that the British themselves were importing for consumption. This conflict, by the way, is sometimes called the First Opium War because another conflict over similar issues occurred about a decade later, and it lasted from 1856 to 1860. And this time around, the British and the French, with a few guest appearances from the United States and other minor players, wanted everything. They didn't just want a few ports where they could trade openly, but they wanted complete, full, open trade across all of China, including the interior. They also wanted to have opium legalized in the country and freedom of religion, and a handful of other demands. And the Chinese were once again smashed. They had a few victories here and there, but the still superior, at this point, technology of the Westerners, along with the increasingly debilitating levels of opium addiction within the ranks of the Chinese army, ensured that the Chinese were at a substantial disadvantage from the very beginning all the way to the end of the conflict. Now, I bring these wars up not just because they're interesting and interestingly considered to be the beginning of modern Chinese history. I bring them up because they are representative of something that we don't often talk about, that drugs and war kind of go hand in hand. And this has been true all throughout history. If you were to do a full accounting of historical conflicts and, and even the conflicts of today, you would be unlikely to find a war or even a minor international boots on the ground incident that doesn't have intoxicants or mind altering substances of some flavor influencing how the dice land and how the people involved, especially the soldiers, find themselves after the smoke is cleared. In the Napoleonic Wars, for instance, the British troops were allotted a massive daily alcohol allowance, which was called their rum ration. And consequently, when entering combat, particularly under non-ideal circumstances, British troops were more often than not more than a little tipsy. And it's notable that many of these same troops were also recruited through alcoholic means. 
the military recruiters would buy potential soldiers drinks until they reached the point where they were so drunk that they would sign just about anything, including a contract to go do a tour of duty. During the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879, the British army faced off against the Zulu kingdom in Africa. This war started as a result of a casus belli, that is, an act that is used as an excuse to go to war. And this casus belli was manufactured by the British. Numerous small incidents were inflated in their official reports to seem more significant, which then led to an ultimatum, which then led to the pretext for war. And interestingly, for the purposes of this conversation at least, although the British eventually conquered the Zulu, the first battle of that war was a huge victory for the Zulu over the British. And it should be said that the numbers were on the side of the Zulu. They had something like 20,000 troops, while the British only had something like 2,000. But the technology disparity here was so crazy. The, the levels that each side had were so out of whack. Consider that during the Opium Wars, the British were able to take over cities in China with nearly a million residents in these cities, and all they had was 5,000 troops. So a million, potentially, against 5,000. That is how technologically superior the British military was at this point in history. And here they were, the British, losing with their top-of-the-line state-of-the-art rifles and their 76mm field guns against a mere militia, not even professional troops with much training, that outnumbered them 10 to 1. But this militia of people who were not even well-trained troops, and they were wielding spears and cowhide shields. And so by all accounts, it should have been a much closer match, if not just an outright laughable victory for the British. But it wasn't, and there are strategic reasons for this. Looking back through the lens of history, we've been able to identify some of the smart things that the Zulu did and some of the dumb things that the British did and should not have done. But there's another small element here that some historians also claim played a role in this battle, and that is the Zulu's traditional warfare usage of THC-heavy snuff and psychedelic mushrooms. And the combination of these two things, apparently, would give them a feeling of euphoria and fearlessness and calm, and it would reduce their experience of pain. Whether those specific drugs actually influenced the outcome of that specific battle is very debatable. But less debatable, I think, is the role that morphine played in the lives of soldiers during the U.S. Civil War, or the influence that tobacco had in calming soldiers' nerves on the front lines during World War I, and the influence of amphetamines on soldiers of all nationalities, but especially the Germans, during World War II, and the impact of marijuana, and then, after it was banned by the top brass, heroin on soldiers who went away to fight in Vietnam and the influence of so-called brown-brown, which is a mixture of cocaine and gunpowder on the child soldiers that was forced on in the Sierra Leone Civil War, and the impact of drugs like Artane, the brand name of a prescription pill that is typically given to Parkinson's patients, which calms the nerves related to combat stress in a way we don't fully understand, on the soldiers who took it in Iraq. So there's an existing behind-the-scenes use case of drugs in a commonly accepted aspect of society, warfare. And this is something that probably wouldn't surprise many people who have been to war, but it might catch some of us who haven't a little bit off guard. Because it seems at odds with the perception we have of both soldiers and drug users. There's a conflict in those labels. We perceive drug users to be reckless and hedonistic, maybe a little bit out of touch with the real-world issues that the rest of us deal with. Because all they're trying to do is escape the real world, right? They are altered and careless and sluggish. Or if not that, they're buzzed and frantic and not thinking straight. They are hazards to society. Soldiers, though, 
we perceive to be fulfilling a duty to a larger collective. They are fighting for what's right, or at least fighting because they said they would, fulfilling their duty. They are trying to make things better. They're being patriotic. They're being heroic. They are responsible. They are predictable and reliable. Slamming these two seemingly diametrically opposed broad stroke labels against each other can result in a kind of cognitive dissonance. It's maybe a little bit difficult for us to be able to see soldiers as reckless drug users and drug users as potentially heroic, self-sacrificing patriots. Consider, though, that drugs are not only used by thrill-seekers, or maybe we should say meaning-seekers or experience-seekers and people engaged in mental stability-jolting combat. It's not just one or the other. There are a lot of use cases in between those two extremes. As I mentioned before, MDMA was used by therapists back in the mid-20th century through the 1980s. But MDMA is not the only psychedelic drug to have been used in this way. Throughout the years, therapists have also made good use of LSD and psilocybin, which is the main active ingredient of so-called magic mushrooms, and mescaline, which is the main active ingredient in peyote, and DMT, and a substance called 2CB, all of which have purportedly helped the therapist get their patients into a kind of self-exploratory state. In most cases, this meant administering the drug and having the therapist there with the patient as they experienced the effects of the drug, so that the patient could then be guided through a heightened process of self-exploration, a place where they could see themselves and their actions and their lives from a sort of -of out-of-body perspective. Research into the clinical uses of these drugs has only recently begun again after decades of scientists largely being banned or at least very convincingly dissuaded from exploring them further. And that's unfortunate because these substances have actually been shown to help people who suffer from things like OCD and PTSD and alcoholism and depression and even things like migraines and cluster headaches. And interestingly, even drugs that have no record of any negative side effects, like that aforementioned 2CB, a drug that essentially acts as a toned-down MDMA, and which is often mistakenly sold as ecstasy at raves, has been banned in most countries, which has limited the scientific community's ability to understand it fully, including how it does what it does to humans who ingest it, and has also limited the medical community's ability to understand how such drugs might be used in tandem with therapy or equally important, why these substances absolutely should not be used in these ways. And where we stand now is kind of an awkward in-between place. We know enough to see that there are a lot of potential uses for these types of drugs. The use of psychedelics in helping those who suffer from PTSD, for instance, as well as the possibility of using things like marijuana to mellow the side effects of cancer treatments. But we also don't know enough to fully understand the consequences and the trade-offs involved in these uses. Most likely, if we were able to more thoroughly investigate these drugs and their effects, we would discover that some are excellent solutions to problems that we have, and that they have fewer downsides than the solutions that we currently use while also discovering that others have just untenable consequences that we heretofore only see rarely or in situations in which the empirical process cannot quantify the likelihood of such a negative outcome. It could be, for instance, that MDMA at certain doses or when used continuously for a certain period of time has a substantial chance of causing extreme depression in those who use it, I am absolutely not saying that this is the case. I don't think there's any evidence for this, but I am saying that if it were to be the case, that is something we would want to know so that we could better trace an outline of what use cases actually do make sense for this drug and which do not, so that we have a more complete understanding of these drugs, but also of our own biologies 
why these things act the way they do when we ingest them. Now, there are existing fringe cases for this type of research already. There are people who use these types of drugs regularly and as a result provide some anecdotal data for scientists and doctors to, to draw some base-level conclusions from. But anecdote is only ever the start of real exploration and can never be the completion of it. It gives us a starting point from which to jump off into more data and the collection of it. But anecdote itself is unreliable in the practical sense, and perhaps even more so when the people experiencing the effects of these types of drugs are the ones doing the reporting. Thankfully, there are also people who are operating within this fringe that are making use of more consistent, neutral documentation methods in an attempt to understand how drugs are most ideally utilized, the amount, the duration, the effects, any other variables that might affect the math and formulation. And these people are sharing this information with the world, primarily via the internet or within small communities. One of the more notable movements in this regard is one that surrounds drugs that have come to be collectively called nootropics or smart drugs. The nootropics community has done a commendable job, I think, at essentially setting up individual case studies while testing different substances believed to be capable of some type of cognitive enhancement. And though the validity of the majority of these studies would still be inadmissible in a real scientific setting, because they're still primarily just well-conducted anecdotal research projects, the overall approach, I think, is quite laudable, because they do seem to be attempting to set up a framework for how research into currently dismissed or restricted substances, which may be of value, might be conducted in the future. The same issues apply here as with other individual use cases, unfortunately. There are no hard set standards that all users adhere to. There's no outside, unbiased party involved in the testing. And there are no reliable standards for replication. I can imagine a future in which something more grounded emerges from this still burgeoning community. Maybe a set of regulatory standards that allow for experimentation legally on oneself. But I'm guessing that such a system would still only work if there were certain guidelines in place and some type of external checks and balances established to help prevent it from being abused. Something tells me that at this moment, at least, such a system would not exist within the jurisdiction of the United States. The perception of drugs, despite the recent legalization of marijuana and a few other similar substances in several states, is still far too negative for the general public for that to happen in a short timeline, at least. That negative perception is part of why some states have kept illegal marijuana that will get you high, but have legalized the kind that is unlikely to. To understand this, you have to understand a little bit about what makes pot as beloved as it is. Cannabis contains something like 500 different compounds, and about 70 of those 500 are psychoactive. The main psychoactive compound found in cannabis is called delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, otherwise known as THC. And THC is what imbues marijuana with its well-known high effect. There's another substance in cannabis, however, called cannabidiol, or CBD, which is a type of antioxidant, and it also has some properties that are thought to positively impact the brain. And these impacts can help people who suffer from things like muscle spasms or epilepsy or cancer and a variety of other terminal illnesses. Now, like with most of these drugs, the complete, firm, absolute 100% science is still out, but these two substances are thought at the moment to work in tandem. The THC, which is what gets you high, is thought to allow the CBD, which is what has positive medical effects, to get into the brain and work its magic. This understanding, however, of what these different chemicals do has also led to a fork in the cannabis breeding process. 
down one road of this fork, you will find the high THC plants that have been bred to serve the recreational use market, which is focused on that high feeling that is associated with the substance. But down the other road, you find the low THC, high CBD plants that are used for medical purposes and which are legal, at least as of August 2016, in 16 states. I'm fascinated by this dichotomy because what we're looking at here is an increasing level of legalization of a drug that might make you feel a little good, but not in a psychoactive way, and a ban, largely, on a very, very similar drug that does some of the same with perhaps slightly less brain beneficial effects, but which also gets you high. And this speaks to me of a favoritism for things that do not alter a person, or said in another way, a favoritism for things that do not provide pleasure, that are not fun. Think for a moment about that. We have a system that treats substances that make us feel good, just for the sake of feeling good, like things that should be banned, things that are evil. But almost exactly the same thing that does not make you feel good, or at least not in the same way, is something that we can construe as positive, as something that should be made legal. Any time I think about this standard that we've set, I think about Melanotan 2, which is an injectable drug that came to be known as the Barbie drug in the pop news circuit back in the day. I first heard about this drug back in 2002 when it was featured in a Wired magazine article that I will link to in the show notes, which is entitled Thin, tan, hotter than hell, with lots of exclamation points. And this drug in this article was discussed alongside other drugs that purported to provide aesthetic, largely, benefits, but which did not cure anything. And in this case, melanotan, too, would make you tan without you ever having to be exposed to the sun, something that bodybuilders in particular found to be quite an intriguing offer as it would allow them to become bronzed for competitions without increasing their risk for skin cancer. The drug, as of today, however, still remains a doubtful proposition in the eyes of the media. I'll link in the show notes to an article from Fox News from 2012 that kind of shows the general response to this type of drug from the mainstream news media. And the Australian company that currently holds the rights to it seem to believe that their best bet in moving forward and getting government sanction to sell it to the public is to market it not as a sunless tanning option, but instead as a treatment for erectile dysfunction. Not even making that up. It turns out that one of the side effects that has been noted regularly in the human clinical trials for this fake tan injection is that Male users will sometimes get the compulsion to stretch and yawn quite regularly. And when they do this, when they do a great big yawn and stretch, they also become very aroused. And they think that their way into the market might be piggybacking on that side effect and selling it then as a cure for something. This approach to gaining regulatory approval is not a complete shot in the dark. Other drugs with aesthetic or other non-curing, non-medical benefits have gained legality, if not full legitimacy, in the eyes of government agencies around the world by positioning themselves as cures rather than upgrades. By Matoprost, for example, is a drug that was conceived of and tested as an eyelash lengthener and thickener, but it was eventually discovered that it was also useful as a means of controlling the progression of glaucoma and managing ocular hypertension. So the exact same drug, very strangely, now exists as both Latisse, which is a drug that lengthens and thickens eyelashes, and Lumigan, a drug that helps people with glaucoma and ocular hypertension. By Mataprost's foot in the door here was banging the drum for the medical application of their drug, which was then approved by the FDA in 2001. The FDA approval for the aesthetic application, the eyelash thing, 
came seven years later in 2008, at which point the FDA approved it purportedly for those aesthetic uses, but there were mumblings that a big part of that decision was made, at least in part, because there are certain medical conditions that can cause a person's eyelashes to become shorter, thinner, and more brittle. And this drug would be one way to solve that problem. One side note here that I thought was interesting is that the company that owns these treatments, Allergan, is the same company that owns Botox and the Natrell brand of breast implants, alongside treatments for things like osteoporosis, Alzheimer's disease, and acne. They have dozens of assets, and taking a look at them makes it quite apparent that it is not unusual for these types of companies to be involved in both the let's make you better industry and the let's make you better industry when it comes to drugs and medical procedures. But the regulatory preferential treatment is still given in almost every case to even highly flawed drugs and procedures that purport to cure something over those with little or no known side effects that cure nothing and are only additive upgrades in some way. Let's bounce over to another facet of this conversation. Another question that I think is often rightly brought up in the context of these types of discussions about drugs is whether the illegal ones are actually any worse than the legal ones. That is to say, is marijuana any worse than tobacco? Or is it any worse than alcohol? Is it an accident of history or a byproduct of shady business practices that some of these brain chemical alterers are legal and others are not? Further, beyond the legality, is there a reason that some of these drugs are considered to be socially acceptable, even to be indicators of success or tradition or positive values, while others are more strongly associated with hooliganism or criminals? I would argue that questions like this are linked. A lot of the associations that we have with certain substances is the consequence of not only being able to legally enjoy them in public, and of most people being able to legally enjoy them for a long enough period of time for traditions to develop, but also of their being worked into pop culture and advertising. I think if pot were legal in the same way as tobacco, and had been for as long as tobacco has been legal, that we would have a lot more caricaturesque associations with the substance. Maybe not the exact same ones as with cigarettes, the lonesome cowboy, the rebel without a cause type of character, but some type of character, I think, would have emerged that is the pot-smoking character, and that character then would probably be a more positive one than the type that we have in a lot of cases today. And this is because those personalities, those caricatures, those demographic representations of who uses these type of products, they don't spring up just out of nowhere. They are often developed and bought by the companies who stand to gain from those products becoming popular and successful in a business sense. So is it likely that we are so accepting of alcohol and tobacco over things like marijuana and other drugs as a result of one type of drug being marketable and available and the other not, at least in a legal sense? Yeah, I, I think that is a reasonable assertion to make. Now, does that mean that these other drugs that are currently illegal are harmless and purely the victims here? No, I don't think that marijuana is any more harmless than tobacco or alcohol in certain ways. Maybe the harms it causes are different, but they are still there. That said, I also think that fast food is probably even more damaging to a person's body than even high amounts of THC. So there's a lot of debate to be had here, and none of these substances are purely and completely safe, but I guess you could say the same of just about anything. We're looking at very different types of pros and cons, and it's difficult to directly compare them. So when we have this conversation about drugs and our perception of them, it's important to remember where our perceptions come from. Yes, some of these impressions are rational and based on facts and data, but a lot of these conclusions that we have 
both because we don't actually have as much real information as we might want to have before coming to firm conclusions, and because something being banned leads to its own perception-based conclusions over time for many different reasons, are predicated on emotional responses and a post-decision rearrangement of the facts to suit our existing impressions. These are not super rational decisions. In other words, they are very emotional decisions. Something that is forbidden is probably dangerous, is the heuristic that we have in our heads, because that's what they tell us, or at least imply, when they ban such things. This is an enclosed logic loop that isn't necessarily a correct or justifiable one. And that's something that's important to remember when we're having these types of discussions and we're looking at these types of substances. But, and this is a big but, it, that doesn't always mean that these substances are harmless. It could be that we do have enough data on a particular substance to know that, yes, this thing makes you go crazy and eat other people's faces off. Or, yes, this substance increases the user's chance of getting throat cancer by a boggling amount. This does not mean that the government's response to these data will be rational responses, as the continued legality of tobacco, and the continued, in most places anyway, illegality of marijuana seems to display. Then again, there are other types of rationality at play here, other variables that are being taken into consideration. The tobacco lobby, for instance, is ultra-powerful in the United States, and tobacco itself is a substance that plays a massive role in the economic, and cultural history of the United States. It may still be rational in the eyes of the government, then, to keep such a thing legal despite the well-documented negative health repercussions because of all those positive associations that our culture has with it. It may not be rational to everyone, but it may be rational to the people making decisions about such things. All of that in mind, I wonder how we might reformat the discussion that we have around these types of substances in order to have a more rational, less emotional discussion about them. How can we come to address each substance from an unbiased perspective and both do the research and have the conversation about that substance in a setting in which we are determined to, one, figure out what it actually does, and two, figure out what that means in terms of how it will be used and how it could be abused, potentially. I wonder how we might be able to bring those exploratory souls who want to run personal experiments on themselves, using themselves as guinea pigs, into the scientific fold, maybe by providing them with tools and knowledge that will allow them and their efforts to be not just potentially beneficial on an individual level, but also more useful and integrated with the larger scientific understanding. I also wonder how we might be able to better legislate one's individual right to do whatever one wishes to one's own body, while also ensuring that people are not getting high as kites or drunk as skunks and then hopping in a car and plowing into pedestrians. There is a line here, as with anything, that designates where an individual's freedom ends so that the public right to be mostly safe most of the time can be upheld. But I do think at the moment that line is probably drawn in the wrong place, and for many different reasons, at least some of the time, in some places with some things. I think informed adults should be able to make decisions for themselves about their own bodies. And that includes getting drunk, getting high, getting an injectable fake tan that might have dire side effects, or even things like committing suicide if they so desire. But that informed part, informed adults, is part of something that we will probably have to work on alongside or even before everything else that we are talking about in this conversation. Because without each individual having the information that they need to make educated decisions, we cannot be certain that we're not being manipulated or coerced into making decisions that are not actually entirely our own or in our own best interest, whatever that happens to mean for ourselves. 
When we don't have access to the right information, we can't know for certain that we are not being conned or tricked or played by big tobacco or big government or big marijuana, or perhaps even someday, big eyelash thickener. This episode of Let's Know Things is brought to you by you, the listener. If you are enjoying this podcast, stopping by letsknowthings.com and contributing a buck an episode or even setting up some kind of monthly contribution would be absolutely amazing. Very much appreciated. As would the other options that are listed there, sharing the show with a friend, sharing it with your social network of choice, leaving a review on iTunes. These are all very, very helpful and allow me to continue to invest more time in this show. So a huge thanks to everybody who has already done that, and a great big thanks in advance if you are thinking of doing so in the future. This episode is also brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is my hosting company of choice. If you are thinking of starting a blog or a portfolio site or a website for your business, anything online really, it is worth stopping by HostGator.com LKT. They are offering a great big discount for listeners of Let's Know Things, and their service is top-notch. I have been very happily using it for years and years. HostGator.com slash LKT. And this episode is also brought to you by Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT, you will receive a free month trial of Audible and a free audiobook of your choice. And that audiobook is yours to keep whether or not you stick with Audible after that free month. And if you're looking for something to spend that credit on, might I suggest the book Our Daily Meds by Melody Peterson. Our Daily Meds is a really fascinating nonfiction book, and it's about the pharmaceutical industry. And it's something that was of particular interest to me as a brander in a past life, because it essentially shows how medicines very often are developed first by these pharmaceutical companies, and then they go out and look for something to cure. And this reversal of what you would assume actually happens within this industry is really infuriating to a certain degree because this journalist, Melody Peterson, goes in and connects the dots and shows how things like halitosis and things like ADHD were essentially invented by the pharmaceutical company and then promoted as something that we need to cure, something that we need to get rid of, using a product that they have already invented. And so they are able to then label and show that they are coming to our rescue. But they do a lot of the banging of the drum by themselves. They go in and create the problem that they know that they can solve because they already have the solution there in their lab. Really great journalism, a really great read, somewhat infuriating, but a good thing to understand about how the pharmaceutical industry works. That is Our Daily Meds by Melody Peterson. If you want to check that out for free, you can use that audibletrial.com slash LKT credit. But it's also worth a read if you just want to pick it up at your library or your local indie bookstore, get it on your Kindle or your Kobo or wherever is most convenient for you. As I mentioned, I recently rebuilt letsknowthings.com, so pop on by, take a look, let me know if I missed anything or if there's a typo or something along those lines. While there, you can also check out the show notes for this episode and every episode. You can also sign up for the free weekly Let's Know Things newsletter, which is really just a collection of links to interesting things that I share for free with subscribers each Monday. You can also follow Let's Know Things on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook at Let's Know Things. I, myself, Colin, am at Colin is my name on pretty much every social network you might be on. You can find a list of the books I've written at colin.io, and you can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. Thank you very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.